Welcome everyone to our seminar today. Our speaker is Rudy Rotofen from Northeastern University. So Rudy is going to tell us a, a KK theory approach to the quantization commuting with reduction principle, please. Yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation. So I think it's my first experience uh, of uh, giving a seminar online. So uh, hope it will go well. So thank you very much again for the invitation. Uh, so actually the work I'm going to talk about now, it's actually it's pretty good timing because the paper just appeared yesterday on archive. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to try, so it's a pretty short paper actually, uh, but so I'm, I'll be trying to, let's say, give us sort of some ideas about what, uh, what techniques are used uh, in this kind of thing. Uh, so let me just give a bit of background, some motivation about what uh, the, what we'll be talking about. <clears throat> At some point, we'll be moving towards uh, one particular step of uh, this uh, QR problem and a certain particular approach. So, uh, so here's the background. <laughs> so let me see. Let me know. So if uh, everybody can see well uh, what I'm writing. Legible, chairman. Yep. Okay. Perfect. So uh, we start from some compact impact manifold. And let's say it's acted on by some knee group, compact knee group. Uh, and let's say also the action is Hamiltonian for now. So uh, just to remind you what it means in case. Uh, so it simply means that, um, so it simply is, so you have a moment map here. Let's say let's call that new. Uh, and it goes from M to uh, G star. So very often G star and G, I'll make no difference. <coughs> so if needed at some point. So you just identify, identify the two by some uh, gene variant uh, in your product. Uh, so you have a moment map like that. So what does it mean to be a moment map basically? So uh, the definition is just that. So if you take uh, any element beta in the D algebra, take something in there in there so you're interested in let's say looking at the pairing between nu and beta and the differential so here you have a one form and you you'd like to have some compatibility between that and basically your symplectic form in there so uh, the thing you'd ask is to have something like that so w so you here you have to have so if you want to have a one form in here just contract with some vector field. Uh, so beta in here, uh, what is it? So this beta bar, uh, so it's a vector field that's generated by uh, this element in here. And it's kind of the natural thing you can think about. So you have the group action. So uh, this thing acts uh, on the, so, so you just derive that from a one parameter subgroup basically. <clears throat> And you end up with uh, this kind of uh, expression in here. So let me just move that in here. So basically, you take a curve that's uh, tangent to beta. And then you take this vector field. So it ends up being a vector field that's uh, uh, sort of orbital vector field, if you want. <clears throat> okay, so what is, so the, the, the definition here, it's meant to say something simple actually. So it's just meant to say that if you have, uh, you, look at, you look at an orbit. <clears throat> so, and basically if you have an orbit, so having a moment map, it tells you that uh, the orbit will be located in the mo uh, in the level set basically of uh, of this map. So it's uh, basically just what it amounts to. So basically, what you have 
just, should just have in mind is that if you look at, at the, the level sets of uh, this function here, this moment map, <coughs> then it kind of, uh, uh, how to say, it's sort of, uh, you have different layers of the orbits that are in the different layers of the, of the, of the level set of the moment map in some way. So that's uh, one way to think about that mentally. <coughs> so, so that's the context in here. So we have this thing. Uh, if you want to keep an example in mind, uh, you can take a circle action, for example. So we take uh, two sphere, for example. And then the moment map that you could think about in here would you just be a height function. Okay, so you make a picture or something like that. Okay. Uh, so just that. So now, um, so now we have the setup basically of this uh, Q, QR equal to zero problem. So uh, I, I didn't say so QR here, it means it stands for quantization complete with production. Uh, so basically, so <clears throat> I, I'm going to be a bit rough here. So not give too much motivation, but just give directly uh, the, the modern formulation of the, of the problem in here. <clears throat> so uh, Modern problem goes as follows here. So uh, once you have these the different data, so you can build something called a, a radius space. So let's call that M0. And there, uh, so just look at this manifold. Yeah. So it turns out, um, how to say, so in general, the action of G on this thing. So let's say if you suppose, uh, assume zero is a regular value. So if you're under these assumptions here, <coughs> uh, then you always have that G will act on this thing uh, locally freely. So uh, which means with the uh, finance stabilizers. <coughs> so this thing is always uh, a symplectic, a symplectic orbital. Uh, so we'll just assume it's a manifold for us because let's say in the case of NCG, it doesn't make too much difference, let's say at this point. <coughs> so of course there are some subtleties, but you can kind of, uh, so let's say it's a manifold. Uh, what's uh, not completely trivial also is that it's, it remains symplectic. <clears throat> so uh, that's a theorem of uh, Marsden and Weinstein. So I don't remember the timeline here. Uh, I think it was in the 80s, but I'm not so sure. <clears throat> uh, and then, so it says that M0 is symplectic. So the two form is just the one that is, that's induced by uh, the original two form. So you have that. So that's what we call a radius space. Uh, so now uh, you have, <coughs> uh, I forgot some data actually also, <coughs> but let's say, I'll just say it in here. So basically now you have uh, two syntactic manifolds. So this one and this one. Uh, so if you have symplectic manifolds, they are both spin C. And if they are spin C, then they have a DR operator. So both. So uh, from there you have D and D0 DR operators. Uh, on M and M0, M0. Okay, so now it's uh, from here, we, we can do index theory, basically. Uh, so uh, this quantization commutes with reduction problem, it's about a diagram that I'm gonna draw there, <coughs> which tells you the following thing. So 
uh, you start from uh, M omega in here, and then from here, uh, you take the index. So you take an equivalent index of the arc operator. <clears throat> so it takes values in RG, representative ring of G. <clears throat> you can take this reduction step there. Uh, which takes you to M naught. And there also, you can also take uh, the index. And there you can just project down. So here it means uh, elements that are G invariant. And then you can just project down here. Uh, so this quantization commutes with the reduction problem. It just tells you that basically this diagram commutes. So that's the that's the statement of uh, of this thing. <laughs> so I forgot a few things. Normally you have to twist. So here I've been a bit rough, but won't make much importance for us at some point. So normally here, what uh, it's, it's 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 not technically D itself that you should consider. Uh, you should you, you have to twist uh, D by some line bundle. In principle, uh, uh, there are also some assumptions on uh, the spin symplectic manifold here. So you, there is an integrality assumption assumption in principle on the symplectic form, but uh, it won't be relevant for us in principle at, at this point here. So that's why I'm 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 just uh, keeping uh, just, uh, remaining a bit rough here. Uh, so, <clears throat> so, so if you already know about these problems, so you'll know how to uh, correct uh, this um, this vagueness. Otherwise, it's it gives you an overview. Okay, so basically, that's uh, what it amounts to. <coughs> uh, this problem. Uh, so um, now let's take a look at let's say. A bit of history of this problem. <clears throat> so basically, you see, it's kind of an index problem. Uh, and let's say, from this perspective, with we'll diagram like that, you know, it's it really looks like uh, a sort of, it's it's about a certain kind of frontality of the index in some way. Uh, so let's say, curiously, uh, there's never been a very functorial approach to this problem. So, uh, and I think let's say so the purpose of this talk is to show that KK theory is an adequate framework to try to formalize this kind of point of view. So that's, uh, that's kind of the thing. <clears throat> uh, okay, so history, just a little bit of history, so I'm not gonna stay for too long on there, but let's say, I think, so if you do a bit of history, so first thing was, uh, so the, the, the problem here was that set up by um, uh, Gilman and Sternberg, 82. And they proved that actually for killer manifolds. So actually, to be honest, I never looked at their paper. So if someone can tell me in the audience, uh, did they already think about the case of symplectic manifolds in their paper or not? Yes, it was conjectured for general symplectic manifold, okay. and it was not proven for all curler manifolds. It was yeah, okay. only proven in a classical case when you have vanishing. Oh, okay. Thank you, Maxim. So yeah, I thought it was more a sort of oral conjecture, so that's why I didn't. But uh, yeah, to be honest, I, I never looked at the paper. But I think it's good to know that uh, it originates from them. <clears throat> uh, so then you have uh, 95. Uh, so that's the first solution for symplectic manifolds. And that's from Meinrenken. Uh, it uses something, technologies that are very far from what we're going to talk about here. Uh, I'm just wondering if there could be some relationship or whatever. But uh, it's, uh, he, he uses uh, symplectic surgery, basically. So I think the specialist in the audience in surgery here is uh, Chu Zhang. So maybe you can find a relationship one day. I don't know. 
uh, <clears throat> and then so subsequently, so, so there had been some subsequent works. So, uh, so that's uh, there that will be kind of focusing. So you have 98, uh, which is this work of Ken and Zhang. So, uh, which then they set up some analytic approach of this problem. <clears throat> Uh, so let me just tell you the ideas. So maybe I'll, if we have time at the end, we'll go back to that and see what's the relationship between what we're doing and uh, what uh, they were doing basically. Uh, so <clears throat> the analytic approach is basically about, um, so it's an idea that comes from written already. So uh, you look, you're looking up, let's say for, it's kind of an off index here, uh, basically. <clears throat> And so what they do, they consider, let's say, okay, so you, they consider, let's say, instead of D, or let me call that D bar, to say drug operator, like that. And they consider the formation of uh, the drug operator as follows. So uh, they put D. And basically, so originally, that's, it's not exactly how they set things up but they, uh, they add a time parameter in here. So maybe I should call that DT, but... And there they set... Uh, so it's not exactly the way they set up, but it comes, it, 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 it's, the, it's the same at the end. And then, uh, so here the C that is here is the Clifford action. And there, you see of the moment map here. Uh, of, uh, so that's here. Well, that's the vector field here that's uh, induced by uh, the moment map. So the same way as just above, if I go up. So if you take an element in the Lie algebra, uh, then you can induce a vector field like that, an orbital vector field. So here you have the moment map, and then the same way you can create a vector field from that. <coughs> And then, so they set, so they, they set this kind of quantity in here. Uh, so what Witten had realized already in his work on Bohr's theory is that if you take T to infinity, so basically what happens there, you see the, the index of T doesn't change because here, uh, just add, uh, when you add this perturbation here, you don't change the index basically. Uh, but then, so what happens is that when you take T to infinity, uh, yeah, so if you take, uh, take it in T going to infinity, so the, you have a localization phenomenon that occurs here. So the index of T sorry, localizes to uh, any neighborhood of uh, the zeros of the vector field. So what I'm denoting here, Z, Z nu bar, it's, it's the zeros of the vector field. So not the zeros of the moment map here, but the zeros just of the vector field. So that's uh, already, so that's one thing that happens. <clears throat> and then we do subsequent work. So, uh, in the same uh, body of work. So after a bit more work, so actually not a lot more work actually. So here basically that's the easy part. <coughs> uh, but then, uh, so you basically the idea is to estimate you do d square. And you, uh, I, I think your screen freezed uh, in the Zoom, oh. so probably need to reshare it. Okay, so let's go. Thank you, Maxim. Okay, is it good now? Let me try. 
Okay. Uh, so where did it freeze? So at, what, at which moment did it freeze? So, so that I can go back to what I was saying. So maybe I'll just say uh, very quick, uh, if, I, if I go back very quick. So what I was saying, so basically the, the, the goal of this deformation here is to localize uh, the index to any neighborhood of the zeros of this vector field. You know, so a bit in the spirit, so already, so it's a technical written, but you know, it's kind of in the spirit of the poincare hoch theorem, basically. So you have a localization phenomenon in here by adding this potential. <clears throat> uh, so if you do a subsequent work, so subsequent work, so you, even let's call that D new, it's even better. Uh, subsequent work, so uh, D new, so you, you, if you do estimates, basically. On, uh, on the square of uh, this deformation in here. Basically, so what we can show, uh, so that's uh, the, it's very technical estimates here at this point. So the, the formula for the square is kind of something insane actually. So if you look, uh, if you go to their, uh, the paper in Chang, so you can see the formula, it's something very, uh, quite insane. <clears throat> uh, but uh, at the cost of analyzing all these kind of insane, for, this insane formula, uh, so what you can get at this point is that you have localization on uh, the zero set of the moment map. So around. Around there. And basically once you've done that, you see, so you manage to basically descend the whole row here. So you, know, so you have the manifold with uh, the index there and you can descend that all at the same time to there, basically a new win. So that's basically the, uh, the idea. The idea idea of the proof. Uh, okay, so now you have some very different techniques. I, I mean, it's not so different. Actually, it, 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 it ends up being the same at the end. Uh, but now there, are, there is a different perspective. So after this war, you know, 95, 98, actually in 98, there were also some other works of Mein Rankin. So uh, there was a little, uh, a lot of works basically at, at this point. But after this war, uh, you had the work of Paradon. So uh, don't go too fast. Two thousand one. So we have uh, the work of Parnum, uh, and here he uses a sort of more topological approach, basically it's kind of closer to, um, you know, the K theory. So. Uh, and so there, what we use here is a uh, transverse index technique. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce here what he was doing. <clears throat> uh, but basically it's, uh, so he uses the transverse index of a steam ball. He looks at the, 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 the transverse index of uh, an operator that, ha that has symbol uh, sigma nu, let's call that. And so you take basically the symbol of the Dirac operator and you deform that by, so it's the same kind of deformation basically here. So you deform that by uh, this. Uh, the, the vector field basically. <clears throat> so kind of the same thing. Uh, so here basically in principle you at first sight you change the index in this case because you change the symbol. <clears throat> but actually what happens is that if you say let's say roughly speaking, so because you are looking at the transverse index, so here you see you're just twisting uh, the, the, the symbol of the Dirac along the orbit axis. So basically Heuristically, the, the, the transverse index, index doesn't change in some way. Uh, and actually, there is some direct relationship between these two approaches here. Uh, we'll talk about that in the next bullet, basically. Um, <clears throat> but then, so uh, this thing here is transversely elliptic. 
uh, it turns out, so if you look at, let's say, the, uh, the support of this symbol here, so in, the, in terms of uh, the transverse the symbol, so the, the support of uh, this thing, Uh, so it's uh, simply the zeros of the vector field. <clears throat> so, and then, so from there, you have a K-theory element. Uh, in the transverse cotangent bundle. <clears throat> so, what these things mean, so here it's uh, something introduced by Atia. Oh, sorry. So maybe so same thing, so co or not co uh, won't make any difference for us. Okay. <clears throat> so basically you just put the metric and you get all the co-vectors that are orthogonal to the orbits. Uh, so then if you look at the support of this thing inside uh, as uh, in this space here, on this space here, then it just ends up being that, that thing. Uh, so then by excision, basically what happens is that you can localize the around there. So it's the same phenomenon. So let me just write that down. So excision, you can basically, <clears throat> uh, so, so the class here localizes around there. So now what happens with that? So the next step in Paradon's work is to set up, so here you see there, there is, if you want to go to, the zeros of the moment map and not just the zeros of the vector field. Uh, then what happens is that you need to do some further calculations. <clears throat> so in the case of uh, Tian and Chang, it was uh, with these estimates, but I have the courage to write. Uh, in the case of Paradon, so there is something interesting that happens. And basically he just derives a whole index formula for this kind of thing, basically. So there is an explicit formula that he, that, so we'll talk about that a bit later. But basically what happens is that Parnon's approach, uh, it also kind of holds almost uh, directly for if you take a non-compact manifold. Uh, so there is something else, there is also, also a slight addition in Parnon's work. Uh, so it's the fact that um, it, it holds for spin C manifolds too. So you have, you can, can basically set up so you, you have to wonder at this point what's the symplectic what what will replace the symplectic form and uh, what would be the moment map but basically the symplectic form it's just replaced by some curvature form and uh, from there it's uh, so once you so you set a connection you have curvature and from there it's not too hard to build something that resembles the moment map <laughs> so there are there are some re appropriate replacements in this case um, maybe I should say just a few words about that. So why? Because maybe it will be needed later. So for spin C, so for doing spin C, basically you choose a connection. On the, the line bundle. So that's the, that's the data I talked about at some point, but didn't write. Uh, you choose a connection on the line bundle. Uh, let's say that's called that nebula. Uh, and then, so what happens is that you can uh, you take for omega uh, the curvature form of nebula. Uh, the moment map is defined by the equation Uh, so it's defined by some equations. Let me see. So <clears throat> you paired with some element beta. So here, beta is something in the algebra. 
you should assess the difference between the core variant derivative and uh, the lead derivative. Something like that. Okay. And then, so many things uh, still work smoothly. So you, you also asked for having some something that resembles the Hamiltonian action with uh, this data. <clears throat> so you can still work out uh, pretty much uh, the same things. Okay, so there had been some actually so something interesting now is that so uh, the same year. Uh, so Barberman had shown that it's basically the same approach. Uh, so he also made a clear extension to non-compact manifolds, but <clears throat> basically he showed that if you look at so what happens there. So what happens there? So the, 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 he showed that the two approaches, they, they, they yield the same thing, I think. So the, he related the two indices. So I'm just gonna say that in here. So, uh, and he gave also a framework that uh, reunites uh, a bit of this body of works basically. So, Uh, so that's one thing. Um, so now you might wonder, <clears throat> there is something. So he he showed by uh, he showed by hand by basically that the twin indices coincide by doing some deformation, basically analytic deformation. Uh, so now let's say so for people who wonder about KK theory, <clears throat> uh, where it could come in. So when you look at something like that. You probably can't uh, hold yourself about thinking that this should be a Casper product there, KK product. Um, so that's something that uh, I've done in collaboration with uh, Yanni Song and uh, Yanni Lovisides. So that basically you can relate directly these two things. So this one basically will arise as a KK product. And basically what happens is that once you know that the relationship between the two, it becomes very easy. It just comes from some rotation argument at some point. And so I'm not going to give the details of that. So it would be much too long, way too long, but <clears throat> basically, so I'm just gonna write that here. Uh, uh, so maybe I, I, I'll write that a bit later. So now there is an extension of this body of work. <clears throat> so now there was the case of looking at non-compact manifolds, basically. So that was the, so I think 2006. So you had this uh, one conjecture. Um, yeah, I'll just say because otherwise I'll run out of time. Uh, but now, so basically in 2014, uh, you had some extensions. So Vern had made a conjecture in some ICM talk in uh, 2006. I think for extending all that explicitly to non-compact manifolds. Uh, so, so you have now in 2014, you, you, two, two different extensions of this work, these works appeared. Uh, and here M is not compact. Uh, so, uh, so you have this work of Ma and Chong, uh, which basically uses the same techniques. And you have also this work of Parnan and Verne. Uh, they are basically. <clears throat> So what did I want to say more? So basically uh, what I want to talk about there is to have the synthesis of this body of works uh, within KK basically. So um, a bit later in the war basically, <clears throat> so uh, 
we had this paper with uh, in 2019. So, uh, so Louis Des, myself, and Yan Li. So, so we had this work saying that basically, uh, so this deformation that uh, I mentioned just above here, so D plus so. From that. So this thing still makes sense uh, if you look at the context of non-compact manifolds, basically. So maybe yeah. So that might yeah. That may be one thing you wonder. So basically, if uh, the manifold is not compact, so what context do you give to all these things? Because the the drag operator itself doesn't have an index. So if you go back to the diagram here, there. So you need to replace that by something appropriate. But uh, it turns out that this thing, so if you assume that the zeros of the vector field, uh, it's still something compact, then it still has a meaning. So you can still look at the index of this thing. <clears throat> uh, so the cost for that also is that you'll need to twist a little bit in here. So instead of R, G, you will have R hat G in here. The same there. So that's the, you have this little cost to pay if you want to go to compact manifold, non-compact manifolds, but you can do that. And so for here, so it's the same thing in this case. So actually, like season, uh, because you just go around the zeros of the vector field that you suppose compact, uh, so by excision in there, then you can also make sense of uh, this transverse index uh, when n is not compact, basically. So, um, okay, so at this point, so if basically you can show that this thing, so if you reformulate uh, the work of forever man, so this gives you a K homology class on C star G. Uh, so something that we've shown is that you can split the class in two. Can factor that as so. Uh, so that's what I was saying before. So if you look at an operator like that, it looks like a, an unbounded ticket product. So uh, you can really do that. <clears throat> so what you need to do that is to introduce suitable address. So uh, actually, there there is a descent map here, but you can basically split the two. Uh, uh, this way. <clears throat> And from there, uh, you can basically get from here uh, to uh, the transverse index. Uh, and with the direct way, so the uh, so the, the so the the, the techniques are. Let's say the technique here is pretty, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say simple, uh, but it's pretty systematic in some way. So uh, now what you need to do here to make sense of this product in here, so it's just the occasion for me to introduce something uh, that will come up later. So D, it's a K-homology class, not where you imagine. So generally speaking, when you talk about the transverse index, you could you could imagine something like that. Uh, but there, it's not enough to make a pairing with this thing. So there is no natural room, no natural uh, place for this thing to be in something like that. Uh, but what happens is that now there is natural CL gamma of M, which we call CL gamma of M. And that's uh, not, so something we'll talk about a bit more extensively uh, in a few minutes. But that's uh, something that was introduced by Kasparov uh, very recently. And that's uh, something that you can have in mind as being an orbital Clifford algebra. Uh, and now, if you look at this thing from this perspective, from the perspective of KK theory, so you have that. Uh, oh, let me say something a bit more. And you have this class new here. 
that belongs to the catering of CIG. And then you can pair this. Uh, so uh, what happens here? Uh, the interesting thing that happens here is that you, it, it gives you a very natural interpretation of, of what's going on there. Uh, so basically, if you, you just think about this as being an orbital drag rack, so if you take an orbital drag rack, you just kill uh, the orbital directions in the dark operator there. And if you kill these directions, you remain with uh, just a transverse TADP operator. And then this kind of falls directly. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the insight, the, the, the right way to think about that. So, and then you need a bit of work to make sense of this uh, slogan, but that's, that's basically the, the idea. <laughs> okay, so um, that's one thing. So that, that was just for me the occasion to, so we won't talk about this. So this work, we'll talk about that just at the end to say a few things. <clears throat> Uh, about uh, how it uh, kind of unites uh, these different approaches, basically, of uh, QR. Uh, but then, so next step at some point would be to talk about that. So basically, that's, uh, so this orbital cliff Clifford algebra. So how, how do you try to set up everything that's here in KK, basically? Uh, so that's basically about um, everything revolves around this algebra here. Uh, and Kaspar's point of view is that basically uh, the whole things you know about index theory, uh, the same techniques, the same KK techniques that you know for index theory, uh, the techniques remain the same almost once you have this algebra here in place of the usual algebras. That's really the, that's really the insight of Kaspar. Uh, what's absolutely wonderful what, in his work is that, so you know, it's kind of usual with him. When it comes with something new, the, the whole package of little things that you have to check in behind, it falls down. It's everything is true. Everything that you want to be true is true, basically. So, and there basically the work is to, to say that, okay, so he has a certain index theorem in this context that we'll mention. So the, the bottom line of the talk here is to say that once you have that, uh, this QR problem just falls like uh, so one part at least of the the, the main step of QR in Parnell's work it falls like it, it's, it's, it becomes easy basically it, it comes from usual techniques <clears throat> so I'll try to talk about that so um, still have so how much time do I have so we start a bit later so I still have something like uh, 15 minutes something like that Yes, 15 minutes. Okay. Okay, so uh, basically, so let me see if I have time at least to define. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so the, 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 the main step, let's say in QR, so now we will come to this work. So the main step, uh, the main step, let's say in the uh, part of the So, so it's so the main step of their formula is it's a formula basically for the index of this uh, symbol here. So it's kind of hard to go back actually with this uh, things that was here. So as I said, so the the approach of Parent and Vern is to calculate the index uh, for of an operator that has this symbol. You give a full calculation, and then at the end you see how you can get QR from there. So I'm not talking about how to derive QR exactly from there, but I'm talking about uh, for now about how to derive this formula. That's basically the idea. So uh, I'm just going to mention the formula in here. <clears throat> so here is how it goes roughly. So uh, let's see. <clears throat> so basically, you give a, form a fixed point formula for for index. So. So they have a formula like that. So, uh, so basically here you have the equivalent index of uh, the index on the radius space. So that's the thing that you like to keep at the end. 
Then you have some fixed point, other fixed point contributors. I'm afraid your screen is freezed again. Again. So uh, let me. Thank you, Maxim. Okay, it's good now. So I was saying, so uh, the main step in their uh, approach to, to quantization commits with production, it's a formula like that. So uh, uh, there. So, uh, so I, I write the for, full formula, but And I exp I'll explain all the terms. And there you have something like, so it's really like the usual fixed point formula. So that's the, the main thing about the work. Uh, here, there is some induction functor that comes up. So G, G beta, and the whole thing here. <coughs> so basically, um, that's uh, their formula. <coughs> they have something like that. So I'm gonna try to explain you how you can get this formula, basically. So what happens is that if you already know how to get the fixed point formula, uh, in the context of, uh, let's say, the, you know, the, the classical index theorem and, um, and, and uh, how to say, so classical index theorem, uh, you want a big point formula from that. So if you already know how to do that uh, in this context, so what happens is that so you, do, you just have to remark that if you go into Kaspar's framework, uh, you, have, you can do the same uh, having this new tool in mind. So, Roger, do you assume that the uh, fixed point set is kind of regular, that it's a manifold for this formula? Not really, uh, but so what, what happens here, so they, so they, so the, their approach in their case, so the, the in the case of Hearn and Vern, so they, they, they just thicken a little bit uh, the fixed point set so that you can boil down to something that's regular, basically. You are talking about normal bundles and so on. If the uh, if the yeah, so fixed here, point set fixed point set could be really bad, right? right? Like yeah, I know minimal, that. I know that like but they, minimal of fun. They, they they extend so what they, they don't look at the fixed point set directly, but they look at something that's so let's say the fixed point set could be something really bad. But they look at something that's around, so it's already in their approach here. So here I, I invented I invented nothing here. So in their approach, they just take something that's regular. So they take basically what, so I, I'm gonna talk about that if I have time, but basically they, they, they take a slice, they, they, they take a slice around the, uh, the zeros. And then from here, you, it's, uh, you get something nice and you can express the formula from there. It's enough to, to get that what they want. But it's a slightly different approach than, uh, uh, than what you think, I think. <clears throat> Okay, so um, basically, so such a fixed point formula here. So maybe I should explain very roughly uh, what every all the terms mean here. So the B in here, it's a finite. So Perlman uh, and Vern they show that if you take the image of uh, the zeros of the moment, uh, the zeros of the vector field. Uh, so you can write that as a finite union of quadrant orbits. Basically, so uh, that's uh, that's one thing. <clears throat> so and you can so B here it's a finite set of representatives. Okay, so basically that's what happens in here. 
so now what is this g beta in here? So the g beta in here, so once we have b, uh, b star, uh, b in the g star, uh, then you look at the action of b uh, on the g star, so that's the quadrant action. Oh, that's, that's not quadrant, are you sure? That you have a standard I mean, I mean, so for the quadrant action. I mean, yeah. um, so this is the D algebra to stabilize now. For the action, the action of beta. <coughs> so that's uh, just that in here. So m beta, it's a fixed point set basically. So the the zeros of the vector field that goes with beta in here. You can look at that this way. Uh, and this thing is a kind of normal bundle uh, that we'll uh, mention uh, a bit later. Okay, so. <coughs> I should talk about uh, Kasparov's approach very, very quick, basically. Uh, okay, so I won't have time, I think, to define this uh, orbital Clifford algebra, but I think it's enough to have a sense of what it means here. So it, it's just you take a Clifford algebra, but then you allow only, um, only things that go in the orbit direction. Uh, so now, um, Let's say the point here, the crucial point is how to how to say. So there are the difficulty here is that you have jumps in dimensions between the orbits. Uh, so how to make uh, everything kind of uh, how to smoothen everything basically. Uh, but there is a way to do that. It, it's pretty simple, but I, I won't have time to do the whole definition basically. Uh, but it's possible to to. To, to, to really have uh, a rigorous way to define an orbital Clifford algebra, basically. And that's something which is something kind of uh, smooth and no problem. <clears throat> so um, now basically what happens is the following thing. So um, once you, if you, if you just admit that, okay, so I'm gonna continue a bit with this framework here of Cardan and Verne. So you have an explicit description of the zeros. Uh, so they write the, these zeros of the vector field as something, a sum over beta in this set B. So zero can be in B also, of course. And there, uh, something like that. So it can be ugly because of that. So if you have a beta that ends up being something not regular, for example, this kind of thing, but uh, you have this explicit description in here. <laughs> um, so the next step of Pardon and Vern is to say, okay, so <clears throat> how, how should I go over that? Uh, so, uh, Okay, so basically, so I think I, I briefly mentioned that at some point, but now if you want to localize that around the zeros of the vector field, it's not hard, you just use excision basically. So, uh, so you can, so if you take U, any open neighborhood, uh, you take any open neighborhood of Z nu, let's say, something that's smaller, a relatively compact or so you want. Uh, so then you can, so you can easily get something like that. So index G of uh, the symbol that you want equal to index G sigma nu that you restrict to you. Okay, so at this point, the next step, if you have that, is to have a, a, a good open set on which you can describe things nicely. Uh, so that's the following proposition of Perlin and Vern here. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. Uh, 
so they uh, <coughs> we have beta beta not zero so beta equal to zero uh, basically it's easy to handle and that will give you what you want but but for beta uh, not zero so they have this slice theorem basically that allows you to describe a certain neighborhood uh, of, uh, of you uh, as really as something that's a slice. <clears throat> so um, so they, that's what they show here. So uh, so neighborhood of uh, so neighborhood of uh, yeah this component here. Right. Uh, so what they show is that they, it's, uh, I don't know if it's due to them actually, but uh, so it's different. And then, so they, they, they get that it's deformorphic to something of the form in here, uh, to a slice, something like uh, G cross G beta and here's some open set uh, V beta in here. So you, you can describe that kind of nicely in here. So let's call that U beta. And so once you have this description, then that from here you, you you'll be you'll be able to work out the formula basically. So that's the that's their approach. So if I, I don't know if it answers your question, Maxim. So they, once they are there, basically you're safe. You don't you kind of avoid this. Uh, nasty things about the, the set itself. So they just thicken a bit the set to, to have something nice. Okay, so now what happens? So back to, let's try to go into KK. So Kasparov and KK basically. Okay, so, oh, I don't have a lot of time, but <clears throat> I, I'll try to wrap this up quick. So um, basically, uh, okay, so we've seen that the receptacle of uh, transversely elliptic operators, uh, for, of the, the symbol, the, for a symbol of a transversely elliptic operator, it's something like that in the world of Atia. In the world of Kasparov, uh, so actually it's already been remarked before by Berlin and Vern that if you use this thing, it's not very good to have a topological index. So to try to emulate something that resembles to a topological index. So Kasparov re replaces that with this kind of thing, basically. So what is this kind of thing? So you have this orbital Clifford algebra. So it's slightly different, but it's just that you lift your orbital Clifford algebra to the cotangent bundle. To a tangent model, whatever. So now, once you are here, uh, so remind you. So I think. So let's say if you have no group, it's basically no group situation. Uh, what happens? So if you have no group, uh, what happens is that the index of an operator, let's say A, right? That's equal to the product between the symbol times the double class on TM. Okay, so that's a, that's for the case of no group. But now, what happens is that once you have all these different things, so Kasparov manages to create appropriate symbol classes in which you have such a formula here. So let's call that a new. So that's the symbol. That's an operator that has symbol. Uh, the thing I mentioned before, the sigma new. And basically, what happens is that Kasparov has can 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 write that uh, as a formula like that. So 
So here, uh, the, sigma, the sigma gamma, it's uh, something that belongs to this algebra in here. Uh, uh, this thing here, it's something that be belongs to the k homology of a cross product like that. No, sorry, TM. Uh, and now, let's say the, the good point about once you, ha once you have that, what happens is that uh, now you have a topological index. <clears throat> so once you have a topological index, then uh, you have all the machinery, the usual machinery. Uh, if you want fixed point formulas, you can just uh, use Tom isomorphisms, basically. <clears throat> so, Karnan and Verne in their former work, they, they already tried to do that, but basically they have some difficulties because they don't have the KK product. So that it, it, it ends up being that. So if you, if you compare already the proof of the usual index theorem, the proof of Atiyah Singer and the KK theoretical proof. So if you look at some point, there are some complications in Atiyah Singer's theorem, uh, in Atiyah Singer's proof with their axioms because they uh, basically they don't have the KK product. And they have to work out some uh, uh, kind of uh, how to say ad hoc uh, KK product. Uh, whereas when you have once you have the the real KK product, you can just clean this up. <clears throat> That's what happens. Uh, so once you are in this case, it's no different. So you can just remark that let's say uh, you have easy term isomorphisms once once you are there. So let's say if you have V some sub manifold of M, All right? So it's very easy. So in, in, the, in the case of the classical index theorem for KK, it's easy to construct uh, Tom elements basically. So the Tom isomorphism, that's an element from K between KK of uh, C0 TV, C0 TM. Basically, All right. So you have you use some normal bundle and whatever. And now what happens is that the exact same phenomenon here happens. Once you can just replace here now, instead of that, you can use that instead. And basically from that reason, for because of that reason, so the way to get this formula, once, well, once you have this point of view, <clears throat> The way to descend from there to something like that, it becomes simple. So, uh, okay, so that uh, I'll take care of about that, let's say in a minute, but for that, okay, so let's see if you go up a little bit. So uh, we said, okay, so the zeros of the vector field, it's things like that. And just around these uh, sets here, we've seen that it's about sizes that resembles to that. So then what do you do? Uh, so from there you have uh, the fixed point set basically that's inside that. And how do you descend to this thing? You just use a Tom isomorphism and you're done. It becomes really easy. So whereas at some point, uh, so pardon and variance construction is very, very involved basically for, I would say for nothing, but that's because they don't have the right technology basically. That's, that's kind of the bottom line of this thing. Uh, so just one example to, to wrap this up. <clears throat> so at some point they have to use some calculation of Atia. Uh, that's uh, you have, uh, let's say you, you look at the action of the torus on CM. Uh, so you can have a calculation like that, that calculates the transverse index of the dual ball operator for this thing. It's a no, problem. No, no. hard calculation actually. It's not easy. But now, uh, so uh, so at some point in their construction, Harden and Bern have to use that. So the approach we propose here, actually, it's kind of uh, it, it kind of goes around, it overcomes that, and rather, let's say, if you want the formula in this case, let's say this becomes an example of our cal calculation instead. So I don't know if I'm if it's clear what I'm saying. But basically, so you kind of go around all the technicalities because you have the KK product basically. Uh, and once you have that, the formula here, 
it just becomes a it's it just it almost becomes an exercise and it's kind of always the same with Gennady, you know, once he, he comes with the whole package, so you just have to derive the little things that you want from there. So, uh, yeah, I won't have time to say more about the proof. So I'll, I'm already a bit over time. So uh, thank you very much for listening to me. Okay, so let's first thank Rodi, yeah, for a nice talk. Is there, are there any question or comments? Um, may I ask a quick question? Uh, so would, can you deal with the case where the moment- uh, Yanni? Is it Yanni? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is Yanni, yes. I'm not, I don't hear you, so if you can- Oh, I just want to ask a quick uh, question. So can yes. you deal with the case where uh, the, mo the momentum, only assume the momentum is proper? I, I think I can do that, actually. Just proper, I can do that. I think. So, if you want, you have you for proper, you you just have to refine our works. So we can talk about that at some point if you want. But I think so. Uh, we, when we the, in the work we do, uh, so the the work we do so far the others it shouldn't be a private conversation. But so the work we've done with Yan Li is like, where is it? So it's when we factor out this. So it's when we factor out this thing. So I think, so my point of view is that we factor out here kind of too quickly, I think. But the, the issue here is that in that case, this yeah. v, v does not give you a case theory class because uh, its support is non-compact. Yeah, but exactly. So, that, so I think the right way to look at that is rather to, uh, so you do something like, so you keep your factorization first in the cross product, not you, you, you don't go there directly. But you keep it in a cross product, and then you can localize to every part that you want. And so basically, if you do that, it's the, it's even easier than what we've done. <laughs> it's even the easier than the calculation we've done. So, so you, you can do proper. I see. But I haven't. Maybe I should write something about that. But, but yeah. So the, the bottom line here is really to remember that. So once you have this algebra here. You can use uh, just usual techniques, usual techniques of usual KK techniques of index theory. Uh, actually, uh, Gennady just gave me an argument that's very, very nice uh, that I haven't thought about. So he he has an argument where you just reduce to the usual index theorem. It's a very, very nice argument, but it, it would be a bit more technical to write about that uh, to 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 just say that in the seminar. But he he just boils down to the the usual. Uh, the, the, to the usual uh, index theorem. And once you boil down to the usual index theorem, so this is the usual fixed point formula. So it's, you, can, you can't even make any, anything cleaner than that. <clears throat> so that's, yeah. So Gennady told me that on the phone, I think. So, or if by email, I don't remember, but it was very, very interesting. Thank you. Any other question or comments? Well, if not, let's thank Ludi again. Thank you.